As part of the Open University of Hong Kong's Great Speakers series of lectures, renowned cosmologist Professor Henry Tai, Chair Professor of Physics at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and Emeritus Horace White Professor of Physics at Cornell University, shared his lifelong discoveries about the origins of our universe. In this talk, Professor Tai explains that everything in our universe came from nothing. He also discusses the Big Bang Theory, the inflationary universe scenario, and the concept of brain inflation in string theory. My goal is uh, hopefully uh, I will be able to convey some of the new developments and uh, results uh, that uh, uh, physicists and cosmologists have been uh, obtained in the last 100 years or more closely in the last uh, 30 years. And this is still an active field and uh, I will not say what I'm going to say is 100% accepted by all cosmologists but I would say the fraction of cosmologists who think this is correct based on observation of the data and detailed analysis is uh, become overwhelming, uh, probably 99%. So uh, to many of us, this is established. And so I would separate what's established, what's still to be tested in my lectures. So, so make sure that part of it yes, part of it's not clear, part of it to be tested. So, uh, first is that uh, Professor Stephen Hawking passed away, and uh, I have the privilege of meeting him a number of times, learning from him, uh, interact with him, and uh, no question that uh, his love of life uh, is most inspiring, uh, besides being a great scientist, great physicist, great cosmologist. So, uh, I'd like to thank him for his uh, uh, mentoring or help uh, in my career. So, uh, the best definition of the universe, I think, is uh, a Chinese definition. It's really uh, much closer to the truth, uh, more definitive than the other definitions from other languages. So, Chinese definition means that uh, all space, uh, left, right, up, down, forward, backward, space, three-dimensional space that we live in, and our time, and the past, present, future. And that's the definition of the universe, and that's uh, most appropriate as we shall see. In case you don't catch most of the talk, the message is the following. Based on what we know now, uh, everything in our universe, uh, including space, the three-dimensional space we have, came from nothing. Okay, And almost Mathematically, nothing, maybe even. Okay, so that means that in Chinese, I would say mo. Okay, this is not vacuum. Vacuum is different. There's nothing in some region we call vacuum, but vacuum have space. Okay, so when say nothing means not even space. Okay, so that is the origin of our universe that most of us believe based on data observation analysis. So first, let's go back to about 100 years ago that uh, Einstein proposed the theory of general relativity. Okay. We're not going to look at the equations. We're just going to get some basic idea what he's trying to say. Before him, uh, Newton has the gravitational force law, which says that uh, the Earth is moving around the sun because there's a gravitational force, attractive force, pulling the Earth and the Sun together. And since the Earth is much lighter than the Sun, so end up that Earth is moving around the Sun. Einstein accepted that, and then he asked a simple question. He said, uh, since there's nothing in between the Earth and the Sun, except empty space, how does the Earth know about the gravitational pull of the Sun? It's almost a very, very simple question, but it puzzled him, and then, of course, he realized that empty space means still there's space, okay? So there's space between the Earth and the Sun. 
And so he wants to explain the gravitational force between Earth and Sun, or between the fact that we are pulled down by the Earth, so we are all stuck on our Earth. You know, we want to have jump up, we have to use force, and then you will fall down because of gravitational force of the Earth. And he wants to interpret that as a distortion, warp, curve, or strain, or stretch of space-time. So, pictorially, it's easy to think about what it is. Say, think about mattress, and if you have a ball, it would be not moving, put onto it. But suppose I have a bowling ball, and next to the bowling ball, I have a little ball, a marble. So the bowling ball represents the sun, the marble represents the earth. Now, there's no really no force, but because the sun or the bowling ball distort the space-time, in this case the mattress, so the marble or the earth will move in a way which is not like a strict line, but instead as if you feel a gravitational force. So that's Einstein's way of understanding the gravitational force or gravity. It is not due to a real force pulling it, but rather due to the fact that space and time is warped in a specific way. So this allows us to describe other planets moving around the sun and the moons around the planets and all the things that Newton's force laws explain. Einstein can explain it, but Einstein can explain even more. Instead of having a flat space-time like a background, that's what Newton told us, Einstein said, no, no, space and time actually is an active player that warps, curves, and shrinks, expands. And you can warp so much that instead of simple things like that, instead of bowling ball, you have something much, much, much heavier, and then you will warp it such that uh, the space looks a little bit symbolically like this, and that's where a black hole is. So to the best we know now, Einstein theory uh, is essentially correct, and in fact, uh, when we use GPS uh, to find where you are with satellites, you have to include the special relativity corrections and the general relativity effects so that you get the right answer. Otherwise, you'll be way off. Okay. So we know that Einstein theory uh, give us how to correct for the path that waves come to us, measure the distance, and with the warping due to the Earth so that GPS works uh, very nicely, as we all know. So, a different aspect of physics, which also happened uh, to be understood in the last century, is quantum mechanics. We're not going to use much, but again, a little bit is all we need. Okay? Quantum mechanics essentially means if you have a particle which is very, very small, it behaves like a wave, but a wave can behave like a particle. So essentially it means uh, two description, wave or particle, are two sides of the same coin. Okay? And that's essentially the basic uh, key point of quantum mechanics. And then, because the word quantum, so we have light, and light is actually a collection of photons. And each photon is a quantum, okay, quantum unit. Okay? And so, as we see things, Billions of photon is reaching our eye, and we will call it light. Okay. So with this little background, pretty much we get all the physics we need, pretty much. Okay. So now let's look at today. Our galaxy, Milky Way, has about 400 billion stars in it. We are probably somewhere in the edge. Uh, this is not our Milky Way because we're inside, we can't see like this. But this is another galaxy nearby which look very much like our galaxy, our Milky Way. And we are somewhere out there. So in the night time, Hong Kong is a little bit difficult, but if you go to uh, the Saigon or go to uh, outside, away from the city lights, uh, some nights you see a lot of stars. Sometimes you see hardly any. Okay? And the reason is because sometimes you're looking out, 
so highly in the stars, sometimes you look towards the center of the galaxy and we see a lot of stars. So you can tell sometimes you see lots of stars and sometimes you see highly any. And that already tells you that we are somehow in a structure which is more like a disk. Okay. And this is essentially what our galaxy looks like. And then we all look out to the universe. As far as we can tell, there are many billions of galaxies that we can see. Okay. People now can look far, telescope in space and telescope on ground. They can find billions of galaxies. So that gives you an idea that our universe is vast, okay. very, very big. Okay. We are really tiny, tiny little speck in this uh, universe. One important point is that 1929, Erwin Hubble discovered a simple property of these galaxies. So what does he do? He looked out the galaxies, and he can measure two things. How bright a galaxy is, that tells you how far it is. Okay. On average, the galaxy's brightness is more or less uh, within the range. So if you see a dim galaxy, then you can think it's far away. And if you see relatively bright galaxy, you know it's closer. Also, closed galaxy, you can really see the spirals. Okay. He can also measure the thing. It's how fast they're moving away from us. And this is something physicists call Doppler effect. And he noticed two things. First, the dimmer the galaxy further away from us, it's moving faster away from us. The closer one are moving slower. And second, he said, you look at all possible directions, they essentially all moving away from us. Okay. So the natural explanation is that we are not special, but we are somewhere in the universe that's expanding. So again, a simple picture is shown. Suppose a surface of a balloon, I put a lot of coins on it, and as you blow the balloon, the surface is growing, that's expanding. And what happened is that uh, the coins that's close to us will move certain distance away, but the farther away will proportional to the distance, which means the speed is higher. Okay. And so the simple explanation is that the universe is expanding. Okay. That's a very non-trivial result and over time being confirmed repeatedly. Second part about our universe is the following. We have seen stars made of molecules, atoms, photons, everything that we know, we can touch or see, uh, is called ordinary matter. And we realize that ordinary matter contributes only about 5% to the energy content of the universe. Everything we can see, or we believe we can see, even black holes included, is only 5% of the content in our universe. The other 95%, well, about 27% is something called dark matter, mysterious. And then close to 70% is called dark energy, even more mysterious. The reason we call dark is because we really don't know what they are. Okay? How do we know they exist? Well, from a lot of experiments, uh, measurement, because they have impact on the gravity or expansion of the universe. So over time, people can measure that. So the detail is not so easy to explain, but we have two or three, about three methods to measure it. So today we know that the method that we know constitutes only 5% to the contact. And then there's everything else is dark. Dark here, dark in terms of we can't see them directly, and dark in the sense we don't quite understand them. So if we don't know what they are, how do we know that both are dark? Why they're different? In which way we can tell? And turn out the difference is very pronounced in terms of the way the universe expands, the way the other galaxies are moving away from us, the way the stars are moving away from us. And from that, the behavior, we can tell the difference. So first, let me explain what's dark matter. Now, matter is easy to understand because suppose I have three objects 
and they have density, which means in this volume, I have three per unit volume. For dark matter, if the volume increase, so for example, this increased by factor two, we have three dimensions, so factor two to the power three is eight, so the volume increases from this to this by a factor of eight. Then the density of the dark matter, doesn't matter what it is, the density will decrease by a factor of eight. Okay. That's what matter is. Okay. So that's something that we can understand easily. If a visible matter, same thing. You have a fixed amount of matter, the volume expands, then the density of that matter decreases because the total amount of matter is fixed. Dark energy is totally different. So here, what I did is I draw the blueness with dark energy, okay? And the more blue, the higher the density for dark energy. The volume increases by a factor of eight from here to here. The dark energy density essentially does not change. That's dark energy, totally different from anything we know. How can it happen? Okay. The volume grows, and yet the dark energy density don't change much. How can that be? Well, Einstein said, yes, you can have that. You can take Einstein equation and solve it, and you can find that's exactly what something can happen, called vacuum energy or cosmological constant. We'll have that behavior. So we believe that's what it is. And it's possible because different from our ordinary physics, in general relativity, these kind of things can have two interesting properties. One is the pressure is negative. Now, in our everyday life, nothing can have negative pressure. But Einstein tells us, under some conditions, negative pressure is possible. And furthermore, because it's negative pressure, things really expand exponentially. So it doesn't expand slowly or normally, but exponentially. So what happened to our universe? Well, this is the picture today. So I have red is dark matter, uh, yellow is ordinary matter, and blue is dark energy. So this is like 5%, 27%, 68% today. Okay, Today is this. If we go earlier, dark energy is much less important. But if we go further, we can see the matter density goes down. But dark energy density don't change. So as we go into the future, the dark energy becomes more and more dominant. Okay. That is one possible fate of our universe, that in the future, the whole universe is dominated by dark energy. Of course, there's other possibilities. Something can happen before we reach that stage. But if you just take this and extrapolate it for the future, then uh, we look out, we don't see much. Other galaxies move by far, far away from us, and then we start not able to see them. That seems a possible future for us. Okay. But we don't know that's the case or not. Because universe, uh, something, something called phase transition can happen, something catastrophic can happen, or something good can change it. Uh, but at the moment, if nothing really happened, this is the future of our universe. How we know? Because they look at the galaxies and so-called supernova, they find that further away, they are moving away faster. Okay? And not only like Hubble expansion, but really much faster. Okay? So from that, they deduce that there's a dark energy. And that actually is right to reason. 20 years ago, they discovered that. And then that's confirmed by other different observations. Let me go back to the origin of universe is the purpose of this talk, OK? The universe is expanding and cooling today. So you start Big Bang, big explosion, very, very hot universe. And then universe expand and cooling and uh, continue cooling uh, the process up to today, and probably will be for another few billion years, for example. So now, if we go back in time, so obviously the universe, everything is closer by, and then we are hotter, and that's easily to explain. 
that we go back in time, we may come to something uh, what it is. Professor Hawking and his colleague Penrose say, you go back in time, you must hit a singularity. Or something else must happen. So clearly something must have happened leading up to the Big Bang. From our everyday experience, the Big Bang is the biggest explosion that ever happened. And any time you have an explosion, you always want to know what causes it. What's the bomb? Why did it happen? Right? And that's the question that we would like to answer. Okay? Because we don't believe in singularity. Okay? So after understanding the Big Bang first, check Big Bang first. If the universe really exploded, it's very hot then it cooled down. And based on measurement of uh, how many atoms are there and other things, one can calculate, in fact, 70 years ago, people calculate that, oh, if the universe is very hot today, look at how cold it is, then they find that, well, it still have a temperature, uh, but it's three degrees Kelvin. So zero degree Kelvin is minus 273 degrees centigrade. It's very, very cold. But this is what we call absolute zero. Okay? Generally, you cannot be colder than that. So three degrees Kelvin is still very, very cold. But it's a temperature that seems to be uh, permeated through our whole universe today uh, if we believe Big Bang happened some time ago. Okay? And we can base a uh, different nuclear synthesis. We can estimate that. In the 1960s, two physicists at Bell Lab in the US is trying to use microwave for communications. Okay. So nowadays we have cell phone, it's all microwave, uh, and partly because the people have studied, understood them, and use it. And what they find is that uh, no matter what they do, they always have some noise. And the noise they can measure it's always with some intensity at the particular wavelength. This is microwave wavelength, okay? Microwaves of this. Uh, your microwave use about uh, two and a half centimeter wavelength. Cell phone varies, depends on which band you have. And so they measure this, and then they realize that this is clearly uh, due to the fact that our universe starts from Big Bang and cooled down and left behind the noise. Now we use cable TV, but if you use old day antenna TV, and then you see a lot of uh, noise, and that noise, uh, about two or three percent is due to this. So people actually have discovered it, but didn't know what it is before. So with this measurement, later on, people try to measure this more carefully. Nowadays we send a satellite up called COBE satellite, and can measure the whole spectrum, uh, all different frequency of wavelength and the intensity uh, at every value. So this is the green curve, and uh, the Penzias and Wilson who measured this originally is only one point, okay? Not very good, but now they can measure this uh, very, very accurately. This is the, known as the Planck black body radiation. And so we know very well the temperature of the ambient left behind is uh, 2.7260 degree Kelvin precise measurement. And the red cross are like error bars. You, know, you do the data, you have error bars. So, so here's all the error bars, you know, all the red crosses right on top. But actually, I cheated, okay? The actual error bars, if we put it there, you can see it because the error bars are smaller than the thickness of this curve. So, so they blow it up 400 times. So that tells how excellent measurement that is that physicists uh, and uh, engineers uh, are able to achieve. This is about 25 years ago. So once we know Big Bang, we pretty much have a good idea, and we can find the age of our universe because you say going back, and uh, the age of the universe is 13.798 billion years old. So again. This is very, very precise measurements that we can do now, okay? Uh, if you ask a, a doctor to examine any one of us uh, and try to figure out our age, they probably get to maybe, uh, for young folks, maybe a month or so, for older folks, maybe a year or two, 
they cannot get maybe to 1% accuracy or maybe 0.1 at most. So to be able to measure the age of universe to much better than 0.1% uh, accuracy is really uh, so spectacular. And in the last 20 years or so, the field of cosmology become a speculative philosophical field have been changed to a precision science. So that's why we can probe further and further and find out more about the origin of the universe. Now we have the Big Bang. It's no longer quite theory. We start out very, very hot. And when it's very hot, the electrons and the nucleus don't form atoms. And even the nucleus made of quarks are not, so it's just quarks uh, moving around. As the universe cooled down, the quarks form the proton, neutron, and proton, neutron form nucleus. And then when you cool further down, the electrons uh, become trapped to form atoms and molecules. That's how the universe happens. And then uh, stars get formed, galaxies get formed, and that's essentially the history of our universe. We know very well Big Bang Theory. Okay. In uh, probably the beginning of the 21st century, we have pretty solidly established the Big Bang Theory. So now, as I ask, if you have the biggest explosion, what's the bomb? What causes it? Okay. So now we, have, we are able to probe the next level as anything. You, know, you ask something, where it come from? You say, come from A. You want to ask, where does A come from? Then we say, A come from A plus. The A plus come from, you know, so you can keep asking a question. And naturally, scientists, we won't keep asking a question. Okay, we understand the Big Bang. Now we want to know where the Big Bang started, how it started, why it started, and uh, what causes the Big Bang. We also want to look about the dark matter, because knowing the dark matter is very important. And we also want to know more about the early universe. And one way is to bring protons together, hit it at so high energy that the energy corresponding to roughly 10 to the minus 15 seconds uh, of the universe. Okay, so, so that's pretty early, right? 10 to the 15 seconds. We want to know at 10 to the 15 seconds, what does this particle look like? How it behave? Okay. And the way to do now, of course, is one way is go to a very big collider. And here's the collider in Geneva in Switzerland. And it's 27 kilometers where we have protons going around and around and then collide. And then we want to see what comes out. Okay. And this is the detector. And you can see the detectors, these are human beings, okay? So you can see the detector huge. Of course, if you go to Geneva, you don't see this because this tunnel is uh, 100 meters underground, okay? So this experiment people have been doing, thousands of scientists have been working there, engineers working there, and they want to study the proton energy so high that more or less equivalent to the very early stage of the universe, and they want to see what happened there and maybe they can find dark matter. So this is uh, a very small to very big connector. And of course, this uh, experiment has been going on for dozens of years, starting from electron positron and then proton proton. Uh, probably they're going to run another 15 years. As a physicist, we hope that uh, we can go even further. We can go earlier than 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And that will require a bigger collider. So at this moment, uh, scientists are proposing to build a 100-kilometer collider in China. In a year or two, we will know Chinese government want to do that or not. It's certainly an international project. And that will allow us to go closer to the beginning of the universe, closer than this, and maybe find dark matter. So this is how experiments are done. Thousands of people working together. So go back to the question. How did the hot Big Bang start? Okay. And this is roughly the basic summary idea uh, since 1980s. And it says it starts from a single point, 10 to the minus 40 meters, which is much smaller than a single electron, with a total energy much less than the total energy of the electron, essentially smallest particle we have, that we are familiar with. And that point, that tiny little speck, is filled with a very large dark energy density. Not the dark energy that we have today, but similar thing, very similar, but it's higher, much higher density. Much, much higher density. 
And because of negative pressure, that point grows exponentially very, very fast. In a tiny, tiny fraction of a second, from 10 to the minus 35 or less time, it grows to the size of an apple. And then all the dark energy, remember the dark energy density don't go down. So if you grow by that much, from 10 to the minus 40 meters to an apple, and then you can convert the dark energy to radiation, that's a lot of stuff, okay? Which come from nothing, a single point. Okay? And that's the beginning of the hot big bang. Okay? So nowadays we say, how does hot big bang began? Well, the hot big bang began with the universe going through an inflationary epoch for a tiny little fraction of a second, and then all the dark energy stored there is converted to radiation particles that start the hot big bang. Okay. Now this is, on first sight, is crazy, but there's theoretical reasons why we believe that's true. Okay. And so, but that's not good enough. Okay, this is, in those days, like philosophy, so I should separate philosophy from science. Philosophy is based on known knowledge, Einstein generated relativity and quantum physics. We can start something like this, and we can produce something like this. So that means, philosophically, from logical deduction, this can happen. But does that really happen or not? Can we go and check if this happened or not? If we can check that, either right or wrong, that's science. Okay. So the question is, first proposed, we don't know if we can check or not, and then we find ways to check it. And very strong precision observational data supports this theory. Okay. And uh, uh, as a quote uh, Professor Stephen Hawking, he said, there's overwhelming evidence that supports the inflationary universe scenario. And he's quoting all the observational data. Okay. So if this is right, then we start from a tiny pack, a speck, okay? and everything else comes from there. And since that tiny speck has hardly any energy, totally negligible energy, then everything else in the universe comes from that. Then, in a sense, it's uh, something from nothing. So because the universe expands exponentially, the space are created. So before, there's no space. So all the space is created by that inflationary epoch. Okay? So in that sense, we would say everything comes from nothing. In the West, they call it the ultimate free lunch. But in Chinese, we would probably use uh, uh, 某中上有, it's uh, more appropriate. Okay? Now, we go back to look at philosophy. Okay? This is a quote I find very uh, interesting, is that they do think that Something had to come out from nothing, because where they come from? So they always start from nothing. But that definition of nothing is maybe not quite the same as today, maybe vague as compared with this. So they say, uh, here I say, 從無生出有, okay? So this is very close to what we have. And then, 從有發展到成萬物. Uh, so that's very, very close to what we have today. And then he tried to go further, okay? Of course, in those days, they, it's all philosophical thinking. And then they would say, there's a beginning. Before the beginning, there's a be another beginning. And then, at a certain point, I think th they don't know who, how to stop, right? OK, there's another beginning. Beginning, another beginning. So, so where do you end, right? You can continue asking that. And, uh, and, and from that point of view, I mean, they are stuck in a sense that, uh, uh, how do you go further? But now what we can say is that, no, there is a beginning. And the beginning is really absolutely nothing. The reason is, first is, that spec can easily be produced by our knowledge of quantum physics. That quantum physics allow you to have a fluctuation out. So that spec is nothing but a quantum fluctuation. And then everything come out. So before that quantum fluctuation, that's absolutely nothing. Okay. And if you have no space, there's no meaning to talk about time. However, is that spec really coming from quantum fluctuation from absolute nothing or not? We do not know. And we don't know how to test that as far as today goes. 
So that part is still philosophical, but it's totally agree with the physics that we know today. But that spec grow to today's universe, we have evidence. But before we go any further, I would like to point out is that, does that mean that all the total energy we have, the star, galaxy, everything, add up to zero energy? Because you start from no space, no time, nothing. How can that be? Okay. And the answer is actually possible from our basic knowledge. So we know that E equals mc square, uh, that means mass and energy, we treat it more or less equivalently. And then the question is, is energy conserved? Of course, when the universe is expanding, the curvature will, will come in. But today, the universe is you know, very big. We can measure the energy content. And how can energy be conserved? The only way is the total energy today is zero. But we have all the galaxies, stars, all the matter. How can that be? Well, uh, it turned out that gravitational field have negative energy. So for those who you don't have learned physics, uh, first couple of years of physics, you know electric field have energy stored there. Magnetic field can store energy. And in fact, we use it in many engineering processes. But gravitational field energy is negative. So we have mass, we have negative energy surrounding it because of gravitational field. And then it's possible that total energy add up of our universe today is zero. So it just means that the theory is OK. OK, it may not be wrong. So now it's come to the real important part is science. We want to test it. And the test is, of course, partly is before the hot big bang. How do I test it? Well, the first thing is the following. We look out, the temperature is 2.7 degrees Kelvin, but with very accurate measurement. But that's not true in every direction. From one direction to another direction, the temperature fluctuates a little bit. Okay. By how much? By one part in the 100,000. Okay. A few parts in a million. Very, very small fluctuations. And they have satellite go up to look, and they see, yes, there's some fluctuation. And then later on, they look more fluctuation, and later on, they look more precisely. So these are the three satellites that have gone up in space in the last uh, uh, decades, and better, better ex experiments measure. And now, if you say the fourth fluctuation there, due to what? Due to quantum fluctuation. So quantum fluctuation, we can calculate, we can measure those fluctuations, and then we can analyze what I show you uh, in a way where theory experiment can be compacted. So this is essentially that uh, here is that the fluctuation between up and down, and you hear the between uh, a few degrees, and then here between very tiny few minutes. Okay, so this is roughly the theory. Green lines is what theory predicts. That if you believe the inflation universe, you can calculate this green curve, and the red dots are the experimental data. So. This is, again, a spectacular success. There's actually a few more curves, but I'll just show you one. That the theory and experiment in precise agreement to the best we can measure of today. And that's why Professor Hawking and most of us are strongly convinced that the inflation in the universe is correct. This is the first data measured, and uh, uh, Kobe in 1992. And, uh, in fact, George Wood now is a professor in uh, Hong Kong IES. And the better measurement is this. And this is very, very precise. The precision is amazing. That means the, if this is the map of the Earth, okay, so they want to do is they look at all the skies and plot in this way. But if you look down, that would be the surface of the Earth. And the precision they have is that you can pick up, certainly, uh, Hong Kong Island, no difficulty. You can pick up uh, even the airport in Hong Kong. That's how precise the measurement be. And in the future, more precise measurement will be done uh, in the planned satellites and ground-based experiments. So this is how it happened. This little fluctuation in temperature is also because the density is different. And the density is different as the universe evolves. High density means that gravitational pull is stronger, and more matter will go there. And more matter there, higher density, and more matter. So the universe evolved, 
as you cool down, stars get formed, galaxy get formed, all the structure get formed. Okay, so this is how the universe evolved, starting from these fluctuations, which is predicted by the inflationary universe. Okay. With this precision, we understand a lot, and so it's clear that uh, even the spec we can consider nothing, but even the spec itself can just come in from quantum fluctuation. So to say that everything comes from nothing, I think it's without knowing where the spec comes from is pretty good already. But uh, uh, many of us believe that tiny spec that started inflation reverse is just nothing, uh, quantum fluctuation from nothing. So this is precision cosmology confirm uh, a theory which tell us that nothing before. So even you believe in the Chinese uh, philosophy, you can stop, okay. There's beginning, there's before beginning, there's another beginning, there's, but we can tell them stop, okay? That when we say the beginning now is nothing. So there's nothing before beginning because there's nothing, okay? So, so we can say that he can end, okay? And we can precisely tell you when it ends, okay? That means if you trace back, how far you trace back. So, this is actually a lot of data work done by many, many people. Satellites going up, and then they also have uh, uh, supplemented by this uh, gravitational wave detector, which detects the black holes you probably heard of. And then they have satellite interference uh, detectors in the South Pole. Scientists are very dedicated. Uh, some of them have to go in South Pole to work. And then you go there, set up things. And then winter comes and then you have to stay there for six months, okay, in South Pole, okay, to, to carry on with the experiments. By now, there's probably a dozen experiments in South Pole, okay. And now they are starting to build a, a set-up experiment in Ali in Tibet, Chinese uh, first uh, expo going there. And so more and more data will come in. We will know uh, things more precisely and more detail. And that's clearly will be coming in the next uh, decades. So, now you say, where does inflationary come from? Okay, so, so even though we say it comes from a spec, you know, but still you can ask why it happened, what it happened, can we have more details? Then you have to go to string theory, okay? And string theory, I'll go very briefly about that. And string theory actually uh, means that when you look at very, very microscopically, it's not particle, they are really little, little strings. But because if we don't resolve so closely, little tiny strings look like particles. So an electron is a tiny string, a photon, tiny string, a neutrino, everything is tiny little string. Okay? So, but since we don't, we don't have a, enough microscope to look closely, it looks like point particles. So that's why we call particles. But actually they're all strings. That's what string theory is doing. Now why we do string theory? There's a number of uh, fundamental reasons but uh, uh, I'm not going to this now. But I just say the string theory will say there's nine dimensions, nine space dimensions, okay? So obviously we see only three. So what happened to the other ones? Well, the other ones are compactified. So we have something called brain. A membrane is two dimensions, but we have three brains. So we live in this ninth dimensional space in these three brains, which are three spatial dimensions. And I draw two of them, and uh, that's galaxy stars. So essentially, the two-dimensional space I draw here represents three-dimensional space we live in. And outside that is the six additional dimensions, which are so small that we are not able to see easily. Okay. So this is called brain world, a very popular idea in string theory. Uh, and people believe that this is how our universe exists in this, okay? So the extra dimensions are tiny little dimensions. Unless we look very closely, which we are not able to, they are there, okay? And they are behaving in a very non-trivial way, okay? So we can see only the three dimension in the brain, which is huge, okay? Size of our universe. But 
The other dimensions are so small that we can't see it. So in this picture, if we live in one brain, a set of brains, there's other brains, so that's like other universes. Okay? We cannot see them except by gravitational force, maybe. So this sometimes called multiverse, naturally come out in this picture. So the sixth dimension is a very, very non-trivial geometry we call Calabi Yao manifold. And Yao is a good friend, uh, Yao Seng Tong. Okay? And he worked out the existence of this and property of this. And so the three-dimensional brain we live in, we represent by point. And then the sixth dimensional is this uh, non-trivial manifold. Okay? So this is roughly the picture we have. The details we don't have to worry too much about. Okay? <laughs> so how does uh, inflation come about? Well, inflation come about where you have brain, or you, have, you know, electron, positron, if they collide, they annihilate and energy generated. So you can have a brain and an anti-brain, and they move towards each other during inflation. And this region expands exponentially, the three-dimensional, but they're moving towards each other. So originally, you have particles and strings. They all disappear because the expansion is by many order magnitude. But they are attracted towards each other. And as they attract towards each other, they become uh, nothing there, so totally empty. So the nice thing, whatever is on it will be gone. So initial condition, very clear. There's nothing on that. Then they get closer, closer, and they touch each other. But one is brain, one is anti-brain, so they annihilate, and the energy heat up the universe. So there's preserved another brain there, which I didn't show. Okay? And then all the heat coming, because everything is strings, so it all produces strings, tiny strings like particles, and big strings, loops, all of them. Okay? And so the heat is nothing but a collection of very violent moving strings. But universe expands and cools down as we have said already. When it cools down, again, the same thing. The, the strings uh, become not moving, break up to small strings, and then because of the fluctuation, they will form atom molecules, stars, and then galaxies, uh, exactly like what we had before. Okay. So this is, again, the picture is essentially the same as the inflationary universe, how it began, and how the universe get heat up, and how it cool off. That part is matched into the Big Bang. But this also explains where's the origin of the inflation. Now, this is again can be philosophical, but we want to say, is this science? Means how to test this idea. Okay. This is always the important thing. Our job a lot of time is you have philosophical issues, then we try to say, can we turn a philosophical question to a science question? And the way is to find ways to test it, falsify it, or confirm it. Okay? And of course, science doesn't mean we can do it right away. Sometimes it may be very expensive, or maybe take many more years before we can reach it. But essentially, once you can find ways to test it in principle, then we consider it as science. And here again, so this brain inflation picture comes from string theory, which many believe it may be the ultimate correct theory, which in encompasses Einstein theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. Then in this picture, what happened is that uh, not only all particles were tiny, but some of them strings produced will stretch across the sky. Okay? And that will have only gravitational interactions, but can be much bigger the size of galaxies or size of suns. And then the question is, we should go and search for these cosmic strings. And people are searching for these strings right now. It's not easy, but can be done. And hopefully, there will be some results in the next five, 10 years. So let me summarize. I hope that I have convinced you, at least you understand the point that when we say nothing, truly nothing. You can't ask what's before nothing. Okay? That question, we stop you right there. Okay? So it's improvement over uh, Chinese philosophy 2,000 years ago. So everything, including space in our universe, came from nothing. And uh, uh, probably start from a tiny quantum fluctuation that grew rapidly and generated all the space and everything inside it. And 
we are continuing to do experiment to detail and test to see if the string theory uh, predictions are correct or not. So it's an ongoing field, many more experiments to be done, and uh, uh, many scientists coming in. And the great thing is that the technology engineers have improved so much that things seems impossible is becoming possible. And so, thank you.